Hello, welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about off-design shock expansions from nozzles. That is specifically when the nozzles are operating supersonically and either overexpanded or underexpanded in terms of their flow. We'll define what that is. And as you can see, it indeed forms a system of expansions and shocks or shocks and expansions, which continues into the famous shock cell structure, which are informally called sometimes shock diamonds. And then we'll talk about shock impingement on the particular aerodynamic surfaces of bodies, which causes extreme aerodynamic heating and sometimes flight vehicle failure, which is also a system of shocks and expansions, which greatly increases the temperature that impinges on the particular vehicle. Let's get started. First, let's review a few interesting quote from, of course, Dr. Werner von Braun. He wrote, there's just one thing that I can promise you about outer space program. Your tax dollars will go farther. Of course, this was addressed to the American people in their doubts, especially during the Apollo program. The United States of America was not always a big proponent of the Apollo program and landing on the moon, and many people in the country were not sold on the idea. Of course, today we look back with a bit of a rose-colored glasses and thinking the whole country supported this movement. It wasn't exactly true. In fact, most Americans probably were against spending this much money to put people on the moon, even during the Apollo era, which took up a significant percentage of the national budget of the United States relative to NASA's budget today. Here's a beautiful picture in figure 347 of all Saturn V launches from Apollo, Apollo 4 through Apollo 17, and of course, a single Apollo launch for Skylab 1, which most people are not aware of. In all these cases, they have supersonic off-design jet flows from the particular rocket engines, and we'll study these today in this particular class. Now, let's make some notes about these particular off-design flows from Laval nozzles, which are just convergent-divergent nozzles of rocket engines. Recall that there's a variation of static pressure within the nozzle, as we examined previously, through, of course, area relations and semi-one-dimensional flow, or expansions within the nozzle themselves. Let's imagine we have a fixed total pressure or stagnation pressure in the plenum and we'll vary the back pressure. The back pressure in this case might simply be the atmospheric pressure around the vehicle, local to the vehicle, at its particular altitude. Or it could be the pressure, the static pressure in the room. Nonetheless, it's the pressure which the flow is exhausting. It is not necessarily the pressure at the nozzle exit or behind the nozzle. Now we observed cases where the particular exit or back pressure in this case, is not equal to the atmospheric pressure. And one of two things will happen when, say, the pressure at the exit of the nozzle is indeed not equal to the pressure in the particular room. Here, we can have a so-called overexpanded flow, and this occurs when the exit pressure, P sub E, or P sub J, fully ex expanded static pressure, is lower than the atmospheric pressure or back pressure, P sub infinity, or P sub B. On the other hand, an underexpanded flow occurs where the exit pressure is higher than atmospheric flows. That is, for example, the P sub J, or pressure at exit of the nozzle, is higher than, of course, the static atmospheric or back pressure in the flow. We'll now examine the physics of both these cases and, of course, look at it through a particular example. You can remember overexpanded and underexpanded in terms of the nozzle. For example, an overexpanded flow is due to a nozzle which is too long and the area ratio is too large, and therefore the pressure has been overexpanded by the nozzle to below the atmospheric pressure. The opposite case, of course, is the underexpanded nozzle, where indeed the nozzle is too short. And we have not expanded the flow enough through the expansions of the Prandtl-Meyer expansion waves, and therefore our pressure is higher than the ambient, and we should expect a Prandtl-Meyer expansion wave system to be attached to the nozzle lip, that is, the nozzle exit circumference. Let's now examine both these particular cases visually. Here is the first graphic which we will use to illustrate this. In the upper part of the diagram, in figure 348 of the slide deck, we have particular ranges of the flow fields for supersonic nozzle flows. Once again, we have a subsonic flow from a combustion chamber through a throat where we'll choke the flow and there's a particular exit. We'll let P sub B be the back pressure, which is a variable. 
The y-axis of the graph below has, of course, total or stagnation pressure, and we're plotting static pressure, essentially. The static pressure will go down and will be choked at the throat, which is donated, denoted by the dashed line, or dotted line, vertical, and there'll be an exit location, which is denoted by this dotted line at P sub exit. Now the on design condition will occur where we move and have our pressure expanded down to lower values which match the ambient. Here P sub J, the fully expanded pressure at the nozzle exit, equals P sub infinity. And therefore the nozzle is operating on design and supersonically, and in this case isentropically, if and only if the nozzle is designed with the so-called method of characteristics, which is a topic of a future class. We then might view a whole range of over and under expanded conditions. Look at the over expanded conditions here where of course a pressure must rise to match of course the ambient pressure piece of infinity. The under expanded cases will have an expansion where the pressure is lowered because it's higher than the ambient pressure, just like we described in the previous slide. Let's make some notes on these particular diagram. Remember, overexpanded flows will mean that the nozzle expands the flow too far, and the pressure needs to rise through a shock wave to match the ambient pressure. And this, of course, shock wave forms in the plume of the rocket, not in the nozzle itself, like the normal shock. The exit pressure in this case will be lower than the back pressure, and the shocks will form until it's matched with, of course, the ambient. Now, this can be interpreted, for the overexpanded case at least, through the so-called shock polar diagrams which we introduced in the previous part of this class. And you'll see it makes a lot of physical sense to interpret this case through the shock polars. Now, if we have a normal particular shock at A, then of course we'll have a particular strong oblique shocks. To discriminate between weak and strong shocks at particular location B in figure 349, will be the discrimination between strong shocks and weak shock. And finally, point C, there'll be no particular shock needed in the shock system of the nozzle, and there'll be no needed shock. On the left, we put the diagram again for the on-design case, and of course the shocked case where the, the pressure is below the ambient for overexpanded flows. Now let's look at graphically the particular cases relative to the shock polar diagram on page 879 of this particular slide deck. You'll see indeed that there's five particular exit flows in this case for the overexpanded possibilities according to all solutions on the shock polar diagram. Let's look at A first, where there's a normal shock on the shock polar for strong shocks. Indeed, A occurs when a shock wave is exactly at the nozzle exit. This is a case where a very large static pressure rise occurs. If the static pressure rise is shallower, we still need a strong shock according to the shock polar di diagram between A and B. You can see that between A and B on figure 350 of this slide deck. Then look where there's an oblique shock wave forming in B to B plus. And then of course we get B to C minus and finally, we would get type C, which is, of course, way over on the Mach wave on the polar diagram. Let's talk about the actual physics of these. As we lower the overexpanding condition, or keep the nozzle constant in terms of its area ratios, and change the total pressure, lower the total pressure, or raise the back pressure, of course, a lower pressure rise must occur across the shock wave at the nozzle exit or within the plume of the nozzle for us to match the ambient pressure. That's actually what we're seeing in these particular cases. For example, in this case, we see the nozzle with supersonic flow and a normal shock occurs. We have subsonic flow outside the nozzle. It's no longer operating supersonically. If we raise the pressure ratio a tiny bit more, then we do indeed get supersonic flow outside the nozzle exit, but it's almost immediately terminated by a very strong oblique shock wave and a so-called barrel shock or mock disc. In this case, we have a combination of a strong oblique shock attached to a mock disc. You can see in this case, there's also no particular solution of the so-called theta beta Mach number equation in azimuthal, that is axisymmetric coordinates or planar coordinates. If we raise the pr nozzle pressure ratio even more, then indeed our shock waves will be pushed out even more and we'll get a weak oblique shock wave, which once again terminates as a barrel or normal shock. 
in these cases, remember, you always have normal shock, normal, um, excuse me, a subsonic Mach number behind the normal shock and a supersonic flow on either sides of the particular slip lines that go downstream. If we increase the nozzle pressure ratio even more, then we'll have two weak shocks which now attach and the barrel shock disappears. So you can just imagine as I raise the nozzle pressure ratio, I push the normal shock outside the nozzle, it becomes a barrel shock, then weak oblique shocks attach to the barrel shock, and then finally they merge into weak shocks with a normal reflection, which can be solved with theta beta Mach number equation. Now, when the shock waves reflect off of each other, in every case where there's shock wave reflection down the middle of the nozzle flow, you will indeed have them impinge on the turbulent shear layer of the jet, which then in fact reflects as Prandtl-Meyer expansion waves. That's what's shown as these dashed lines. They indeed cross and are contained in the supersonic flow. If we increase the nozzle pressure ratio to the design Mach number of the nozzle, which is supersonic MJ equals MD, where MD is defined as the area ratio of the nozzle, area of exit divided by A soup star choked area, we'll get a completely on design flow that's isentropic as long as the nozzle is designed with method of characteristics. And they'll have nothing but a characteristic net or Mach lines, if you will, within the jet. Let's look at these three particular cases physically in terms of Schlieren. The top image is just where we're getting supersonic flow and we build a normal shock right at the exit, which of course corresponds to case A. As we increase the pressure ratio even more by lowering the so-called back pressure of the nozzle exhausting into a plenum, for example, then we'll of course get the weak oblique shock wave attached to the normal shock and we'll have a barrel shock. These reflect and you can see there's a system of expansion waves behind it which reform and coalesce again into another set of oblique shock waves which we'll look at more. If we decrease the back pressure or increase the nozzle pressure ratio even more then eventually the shock waves start to merge and once again became a case like indeed B plus dash C. Now, if we increase the pressure ratio even more, then again, we get the fully expanded on-design jet flow, as shown in this case. These are extremely weak shocks and expansions in the flow and correspond to part C in figure 350 of this slide deck. You can see there's actually very, very weak or non-existing shocks and expansions in the plume now. The nozzle can be adjusted to minimize these in practice. And you can see here, in this case, the exit pressure, the fully expanding pressure in the nozzle flow, is approximately equal to the ambient pressure P infinity, or the back pressure outside the nozzle, which is at this location. Now, we can finally raise the nozzle pressure ratio even more. And in this case, in fact, the pressure is underexpanded. And the pressure at the exit of the nozzle will be higher than the ambient pressure. So see we write this as PE over PB is 1.5. So the pressure in the fully expanded region is 1.5 times the atmospheric pressure. For the flow in the jet to match the ambient pressure, an expansion must form which is attached to the nozzle lip. We have not pictured this in the previous diagrams of the shock polar and this particular diagram. This is a called underexpanding case because the nozzle is not long enough to expand the flow to lower the static pressure to be equal to the back pressure. So the underexpanding case is the opposite of the overexpanding case in the back pressure is over the ambient pressure and not under it where a shock would form as in slide 351. Now, this happens at full scales in rocket engines. You can see these beautiful shocks and expansions, which we call shock cell structures, behind rocket engines. If you have a can of compressed air, you can also hold it up to a wall with a bright light and actually see the exact same physics. So you'll see the same over and under expanded jet flows from a very, very, very small, on the order of a millimeter diameter, nozzle from a compressed air can and see the same physics of the shock cell structure versus a rocket engine. In fact, if you match the pressure ratios, you'll get the exact same shock system and Mach numbers. Here's a particular picture taken from my former colleague at NASA, Jacob Kloss. 
you can see here we put up a piece of graph paper on the wall and the sun illuminated the flow coming out of a compressed air can. This is the nozzle which comes out of the compressed air can which is fuzzy because it's not in focus and here's where the supersonic flow is. The sun came in towards the picture and went through of course the flow which is located here and impinges on the wall with graph paper. You can see here is what we call a shadow graph which is of course the shadows of light being bent by the rays of sun by the density gradients in the flow. You can see here, you can see the brief outline of multiple shock wave and expansions, shock wave and expansion, shock wave and expansion, which repeat after themselves until the flow breaks down at the end of what we call the potential core of the jet, which becomes fully turbulent downstream. In fact, you can see the graph paper is a little bit distorted here because indeed the densities of the turbulent fluctuations are distorting the light. Nonetheless, each shock wave and expansion might be seen as a particular shock cell. In fact, just by looking at this figure, you can estimate the nozzle diameter and the expansion which forms an oblique shock wave and calculate the nozzle pressure ratio from the picture. You can try this for yourself if you're so curious. Let's make some important points about what we looked at. Remember, compressions reflect from a free boundary as expansions and vice versa. Expansions will reflect and coalesce into new shocks. This causes a semi-periodic shock cell structure. Now, if the turning angle is greater than the maximum turning angle for a given Mach 1 in, say, a particular shell, cell, then indeed irregular oblique shock wave crossings will occur and form barrel shocks or mock discs, as I just illustrated. Throughout the entire free jet boundary, in this case, the static pressure must try and match the ambient pressure. In fact, it doesn't always, and that's why the outside of the supersonic off-design jets are always irregular with the environment. But if you look at figure 354, in every one of the outside shock cells, the back pressure matches the ambient pressure. So you see this is labeled PB here in the first and second and third and fourth outside cells, which are actually annular. Because this is like an axisymmetric flow if we have a round nozzle. They'll match the back or ambient pressure. So you can see along all these free shear layers, the shear layers of the jet shear layer, will indeed match the static outer pressures. You can see here in this case, the shock waves reflect and reflect again off the shear layer and become expansion waves, which see coalesce downstream and become shock waves, which then again, of course, merge into the shear layer again and reflect as expansions. So in this case, you might see multiple diamonds in the flow. And this is why some people informally, in its slang, call them shock diamonds. Indeed, their appearance shows that there's multiple cycles of overexpanded flow and underexpanded flow, and vice versa through the nozzle. For example, this is an underexpanded cell, and this is an overexpanded cell, respectively, because the pressure is greater and less than the ambient pressure. A few notes about the underexpanded jet flow. Remember, when the exit pressure, or the fully expanded pressure of the nozzle, is greater than P infinity, we must go through a particular expansion, as I just showed visually in Schlieren and the diagrams. This will, of course, also have multiple reflections creating expansions and shocks and vice versa. It's just off by one, if you will, from the overexpanded case with starts of a shock. Here's a particular overexpanded example in practice. I showed one particular example for the tiny little compressed air can for cleaning, and now you can see one from a full vehicle. Here we see the Saturn V rocket, Apollo 11, headed for orbit. The outer pressure atmosphere indeed approaches zero at very, very, very high altitudes. Therefore, the overall pressure ratio, which drives a rocket exhaust, would become very large, and therefore, the flow is underexpanded from any nozzle that can be created by man. Therefore, the exit or fully expanded pressure in the flow will be higher than the atmospheric pressure and a system of expansions will occur creating one particular cell. Notice that when expansion waves hit the outside of the turbulent shear layer of the rocket exhaust, it indeed turns the rocket exhaust inwards towards itself and these waves coalesce into new shocks. Indeed, this is of course raising the static pressure across the shocks which go higher than of course the ambient pressure which then reflects off the same turbulent shear layer as expansions. You can see in here where there's a very bright area behind the rocket itself 
that this large high pressure and temperature environment is contained in the plume, which is shown here. Of course, the expansions cause the flow to reach way out, as we showed in the maximum turn A angles of the Prandtl-Meyer expansion waves. So the maximum expansion here is expanding and turning the flow outwards to match the ambient pressures in this outer cell contained by a supersonic jet shear layer right here. You can see this angle of expansion in the plume of, of course, the Saturn V Apollo 11 mission. Quite beautiful, and you can understand the physics of this whole plume in this methodology. Let's look at a few other examples just to illustrate this. We can see the same shock cell structures in planar 2D jets for slightly overexpanded cases. This photo is courtesy of Professor Gary Settles, Penn State, Emeritus. The middle photo is an axisymmetric jet, which is underexpanded. And the lower photo, of course, is a particular 7,500 pound thrust LOX methane engine from, of course, x core Aerospace, published online. You can see these are particular Schlierens and photographs. In the Schlierens, which are quite small in labs on the order of an inch across, correspondingly have the same shock cell system and physics as, a, say, a 30-inch diameter type engine, rocket engine. You can see here's the shock cell structure. Here's, of course, one particular rise in the pressure due to the shocks. And this is, of course, an expansion. Let's look at three beautiful Schlieren of the cases. The upper Schlieren is, from left to right, measured at the nozzle exit here. It's the same nozzle for all of them. The overexpanded case, where we have shocks at the nozzle exit. The undesigned, or so-called perfectly expanded case, which contains no shocks or expansions in the plume. And the overexpanded case, underexpanded case, excuse me, where there's, of course, expansion waves at the nozzle exit. So by looking at the shock cell structure, you can quickly decide if the pressure is over or under the ambient value and, of course, the resultant shock cell system. It's very fun to solve these types of problems. And in fact, by doing a marching system from the upstream to the downstream, you can completely characterize the flow. Let's do that now for one particular example. In figure 358 here, we see a Schlieren of an overexpanded two-dimensional planar jet, so we use two-dimensional theory, showing a so-called oblique shock wave at the nozzle exit, which are reflecting as expansion waves down here. So here's the expansion waves, reflection off the shear layer, and here's the shock reflection, which of course is a weak shock, because we don't have a barrel shock in it. And we can measure the relative flow deflection angle from the relative exit direction with respect to the shear layer, which represents the flow deflection angle. You can see immediately, from Dr. Prannell's lab, we can see one particular shock wave and with its wave angle beta and the flow turning angle. Using these two properties, we can use the theta beta Mach number equation and cross the shock and find M2. And we can find, of course, all other properties by knowing the normal shock relations applied to oblique shock waves. This Schlieren was found, of course, from Professor Prannell's lab and conducted the same year as the Wright brothers were doing their first flights in the Carolinas and Ohio in Americas. Let's look at one particular example now of an overexpanding case. Remember, an overexpanding case has static pressure below the atmospheric pressure, and therefore the pressure must rise across the shock which forms at the nozzle exit. From Prannell's diagram, we see there's about of a turning angle of about negative 3.71 degrees. You'll also notice that since this is a 2D jet, there's a planing of symmetry down the middle. An axisymmetric jet would have a line of symmetry that is an infinite number of planes going through that line down the center of the nozzle. We see that this particular helium jet exhausts the atmosphere at an exit Mach number or fully expanding Mach number of approximately 1.5. The pressure in the atmosphere is greater than the exit pressure, so therefore the jet's overexpanded and we must match the pressure of the atmosphere in region 1 which we'll do now. So we seek to find the Mach numbers, and we can also find thermodynamic properties afterwards in regions one through six of the sketch above. Let's walk this through carefully. <clears throat> As I already mentioned, the flow is much about the center line shown. Therefore, the exit Mach number is 1.5 with a turning angle of the flow of 3.71 degrees. Therefore, we can find M1 in region one from the theta beta Mach number equations and crossing it with a particular wave angle of M1 of 3, 
The left running oblique shock wave will indeed, from 1 to 2, is found by requiring the flow to back to turn the horizontal, just as the oblique shock wave reflected from a solid wall, line of symmetry. So in 2, you can see from 1 to 2, we must turn the flow back into the original direction. And therefore, the flow deflection angle must be 3.71 degrees to turn the flow back into the parallel direction with the nozzle original flow. Therefore, using M1 in region 1 and 1.34 sex, and again the turning angle of 3.71 degrees, we can use the theta beta Mach number relation and oblique shock wave equations we previously developed to find M2 is 1.182 with a corresponding static pressure rise of 1.252. Remember, the pressure rise from the exit to 1 is simply matching the atmospheric pressure, which is usually a known value anyway. Now we know that P1 is the atmospheric pressure, which is also equal to P3 and P5. As you can see, because these are cells which are connected to the atmosphere, which don't turn the flow by definition on the supersonic shear layers. Now, we know they can't support a pressure difference, and therefore the expansion fan to reach region 3 from region 2 must, of course, what? Lower the pressure to the ambient pressure. Therefore, we can find Mach 3 through the particular static pressure chain ratio after we find P2 over P0, which of course is 0 0.384 and M2. So we take our Mach number at 2, and we know the static pressure ratios, and we know the total pressure loss from the exit to 1 to 2 as we cross two particular shock waves. Remember, this is an isentropic lookup only, so we can find P2 over P0 from M2 equals 1.182, which is just an isentropic lookup. Now let's write out our static pressure ratios as I mentioned. We can write P3 over P0, which is what we want to find. We want to write P3 over P0 times P2 over P2 and rearrange into P3 over P2 times P2 over P0. We know these two values already as we showed and we'll get 0 0.384 over 1.252. Solving we'll get 0 0.307 for the ratio of the static pressure in 3 divided by the total pressure in the particular flow at that location. Now, we can look up P3 over P0 in, of course, region 3, as it's isentropic from 2 to 3, because it's isentropic flow, as you see, because it's across an expansion. And indeed, we'll get a Mach number of 1.35. So indeed, through the expansion, we have re-accelerated our flow to 1.35. We can then look up the Pramel-Meyer turning angle, of course, or calculate from the Pramel-Meyer function nu3 equals 6.477 degrees. Also from region 2, we can look up and find 2.760 degrees from the Mach number in region 2. We therefore know the change in the Pranel-Meyer function angle and degrees from 2 to 3, and we subtract them from nu3 minus nu2, a 6.477 minus 2.760, and you'll get indeed 3.717 degrees. So we found the Pranel-Meyer angle. That means we can find the turning angle. The turning angle, of course, is a delta of 3.717 degrees. And you can see, indeed, the turning angle is not changed by crossing from one fan to another, as you see from two to three. But indeed, our angle of the flow is positive relative to initial flow direction. Now we want to go from region three to four, which is another expansion, and then four to five. So we need to find the delta angles again from 3 to 4. We would want to turn our flow back into itself at the same angle because, of course, the shock cell structure maintains its shape, except for, of course, the spreading of the turbulent shear layer, which is not accounted for in this particular theory, which is inviscid. Therefore, the change in Pranel-Meyer angle from 4 to 3 will be, again, 3.717 degrees. We know nu 3, which we previously calculated, we can substitute that in and therefore find nu4 of 10.194 degrees. From the isentropic tables in the Pranel-Meyer function, you can look up for nu4 of 10.194 degrees, a new Mach number 1.5. So you see, once again, our Mach number has increased from region 3 from 1.35 to 1.5. Excellent. Now, we'll have, of course, losses across both oblique shock waves. It's only 2%. And indeed, it's such low Mach numbers and such a low small loss, there'll be only a small, small change before we return to region four. So that only small total loss across the shocks means that what we have in region four, 
is almost equal to, in fact, what we have in the original region at the exit. That means we can once again cross the reflected compressions from 4 to 5 and subtract the same delta V and return to Mach 5 to the same values as M3. That means we returned, of course, to Mach number 1.35, and therefore the Mach number in region 6 is equal to the region of Mach 2, 1.182. You can see that in this particular diagram. Now, you'll see from this point on, we have repeated and found almost exactly the same values because there's only a 2% loss. This means that with no viscous effects and the proper theory of shocks and expansions in inviscid flow, this would repeat forever. In reality, the turbulent shear layer in Calvin Humboldt's instabilities creates a fully turbulent flow in the shear layer which collapses and collapses the shock wave and shock cell structures. Therefore, this does not go on forever, of course. It actually dissipates and terminates at the end of what we call the potential core, where these equations are valid. That is, it's in the potential flow or potential core of the fully expanded, underexpanded or overexpanded jet flow. Try doing this marching problem yourself, and we'll do more practice problems, and of course, in the homework. I'd like to now turn our attention to the idea of shock impingement on heat transfer on particular aerodynamic bodies. Often shock waves are attached to the leading edge of a body or a bow shock and at high speeds they wrap around the vehicle and might impinge on control surfaces or wings, very much like happened on the space shuttle. Let's look at one particular experiment and see another case where the shock cell structure appears and intersects with the body this time, unlike the jet case where it exhausts into the atmosphere. In hypersonic and high-speed supersonic flows, this is often observed where high heat transfer and high temperatures are achieved in a vehicle, which might lead to vehicle failure. This was studied in one particular AIWA journal article from Edney in 1986, over a page of six pages. In this case, he made a small hemispherical model with a thin film thermometer and it's placed into a hypersonic wind tunnel. And we're going to look at this experiment, and you'll see that the equations can also be used, which we developed here, to analyze the problem. But we'll leave it as an exercise to yourselves to find out the relative temperatures and heating in the flow. So indeed, an impingement shock is imposed on the particular model, and we'll look at the heat transfer rate in the experiment. Let's look at the experiment now. Here in 360, we have repeated and shown the picture from the figure of Edney. The flow moves from left to right. Here's the thin film thermometer. The flow moves hypersonically from right to left, excuse me. And indeed, he has imposed an incoming shock wave from the upstream. Here's a bow shock. This bow shock would be undisturbed and have a smooth surface if the shock wave didn't come in. So here we have a shock wave from the leading edge of the vehicle impinging on, say, what might be modeled as a wing segment or a control structure. The shock waves, when they emerge, reflect in multiple directions and alters the bow shock greatly. This causes a shock cell system to be formed, which eventually bends around and hits the vehicle. You can see there's a very, very high temperature relative to the ambient temperatures, excuse me, other temperatures around the front of the surface, denoted by this strong peak in his measurement. Here's a particular X over R versus pressure diagram. Generally, here is the top and bottom of the hemisphere, bottom to top, along X over R location. This little part here has tremendous overpressures. This is where that shock cell system is impinging. Here we can see the incoming flow is at about Mach 4.6. This is a particular Schlieren image of the particular incoming shock which reflects off the oblique shock and comes down into a system. We'll zoom in even closer in here. And here is he's used the theory we developed in this class to find the Mach numbers within the shock and expansion system by marching downstream from his ambient conditions of, in this case, Mach 4.6. This Mach number is found, of course, M1 by crossing the shockwave PU. And then, of course, he marches downstream more from PK and QRRS. Here's a better visualization for the Mach 4.6 flow, where here's the incident shock from the leading edge of the vehicle hitting the oblique shock system, which turns it. 
The original oblique shock is from P to T and T to Q and Q to V. The impingement or incident shock is from U to P. It of course reflects and turns the flow in through a shock cell system just like the jet system, but it's turning of course to match the values on each side of the system just like the flow turned in the jet case to match pressures in adjacent cells. In this case we've gone through a multiple shock expansion system which comes up to XY which terminates on the vehicle. Here's a close in Schlieren image. Here's the incident shock from P to U. Here's PT. This is PQ. This is point Q to V where my cursor is moving and then you can see here's the shock cell system that wraps around. So this is a Schlieren image of the density gradients of the flow and here's the vehicle surface from XY. Here's XY. And therefore his theory where he calculates the pressures and temperatures by marching downstream across multiple oblique shocks and expansions finds the total pressures and temperatures at the wall, which of course he found through his experiment. Indeed his results closely match. Now the temperatures and pressures are humongous at this location and lead to flight vehicle failure. This is why, say, certain wing segments of the X-15 showed huge melting points in their flight tests because nobody was aware of the types of shock cell systems that occur in advance of the flight tests to impinge on the wing. Indeed, this is a famous experiment where Arthurian class has come into practice in actual flight vehicles. In this class, we looked at and defined the shock cell system in overexpanded and underexpanded supersonic jets. We applied this, of course, to particular graphs, Schlieren, and did one example problem, which I encourage you to work through. All it is is a marching problem where you are applying consecutively shocks and expansions, or shocks and expansions, in a periodic system, which of course terminates eventually by the collapse of the turbulent shear layers on an actual rocket engine or air breathing jet engine flow. You also see that the physics of these flows scales all the way from the tiniest little nozzles like a compressed air can all the way to full scale rocket engines and even outer space phenomena in astrophysics. We then turn our attention to the shock impingement an attachment problem from aerodynamic bodies at high speed, where you see the same types of systems happen, but they're bent around due to, of course, the balancing of the static pressures inside each shock cell with the outside pressures. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.